Good morning, everyone. And I really want to say a big thank you to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, the organizers of this um, wonderful conference. I, I can't tell you how important it is uh, to participate in these events and to participate in the research efforts that go on. As someone who has benefited in the past when I was in the, in, uh, in the lab and also when I started my own lab, I can tell you firsthand that the monies that you contribute and the time and effort you put into these to raise money actually does go straight to the researchers and helps uh, advance our field. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the future here uh, as we sort of talk about the pipelines and what's coming down, uh, down the, the track here. Uh, Dr. Hong is going to take over in the second half and kind of go into a little more detail. But today's agenda from our standpoint is to look at the, the FDA clinical uh, design process, start to get an overview of some of the, the pipeline medications and therapies that are coming. And I also want to sort of highlight how the, the goals of IBD therapy have changed over time. So I'm, I'm old enough to remember the pre-biologic era, so we'll kind of go into that a little bit too. The drugs, um, are good. we're going to discuss the new drugs that are on the horizon, including some new formulations of some of the older medicines that are, are kind of coming into play, and also some of the newer classes of therapy uh, that are out there. So <clears throat> just to talk about the FDA clinical uh, trial process and give you an understanding of this. Um, so it starts in the, in the preclinical phase. So that's, that's where you know, scientists are working in the lab. And they discover something that's got some really cool anti-inflammatory pro properties, maybe a molecule, maybe an antibody. And they say, OK, this, this looks like it may have some benefit for a particular disease, um, for Crohn's disease or colitis. And they want to then test it. So they go in the lab and they do some animal models to make sure that it does have some efficacy and, and kind of get a sense of the, the dose in the animal and any toxicity issues and that sort of thing. And then it moves on from that sort of preclinical phase into the, into the um, phase one human trials. And this is where they take all the information, they take it to the, the FDA, and the Food and Drug Administration says, OK, you can try it in people. And the first phase of this, this phase one trial, is just about safety. That's all we're looking at in that, in that setting. So we just want to know, OK, it, it was, we got an idea of what it's doing in animals and cells. Is it safe to put in people? And that's, that's the phase one trials. So not really looking for efficacy, not looking for anything else, just, just is it safe? Does it cause any damage to the liver or, or kidneys or something? Um, and does it react differently in people in some way? And this is a very small number of participants. So we're seeing around 10, 20 you know, type of, of level of people uh, that volunteer for this study. Then it goes into the phase two trial, and this is the dosing trial. So now we want to know if this medication is something we give once a day. Is it something we give twice a day, three times a day, or once a month, once every three months? And that the pharmacokinetics get worked out during this phase two uh, component. And the FDA will kind of <clears throat> take all this information. And, and also during that time, again, they're still looking for safety. They are maybe starting to see if there's some efficacy as well. And the FDA will take all the information from the company, look at it, and then if they say it's okay, they'll move into the phase three trial. And the phase three trial is the big trial. So we've gone from around 10, 20 people, we get phase two, we're in about 50, 60, maybe 100 or so people. Phase three, we're talking about 500 to 1,000 or more. And this is the big multi-center trial. This is where it's being done, maybe internationally even. And the medication is, is then tested usually at a couple different dosing regimens. And they're trying to figure out how efficacious this is. Does it work better than standard therapy? Um, is it, and, the, and this, the FDA may require you actually to test sometimes against the placebo as well. And these are also sometimes crossover trials. They may start on a placebo and then switch over to, uh, to the study medication and vice versa. And these are big, big trials, very expensive to do. And these are the ones that um, really get to the point where is the medicine going to work. If it does show it works and everything looks really good from a safety uh, standpoint, then the FDA says, OK, you can bring it to the market. And it gets approved. 
And once the medication's out there and everyone's using it, you may even see some phase four trials. And the phase four trials are what we call aftermarket trials, and these are ones where it's being, it's shown it worked in Crohn's disease, but does it work in the fistula form of Crohn's disease? Is it something that works um, uh, in pouchitis or another area? And this is where these aftermarket trials come into play. Uh, sometimes even where it's been approved in adults, they might try testing it in adolescents. Sometimes the FDA actually requires you to go back for pediatric trials and go back to that phase one, two, three level as well. So this is a long process. This is years, and this is why people get frustrated. Why isn't it going faster, that sort of thing. But it, it all has to be done very carefully and very safely for obvious reasons. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's sort of the overview of the process that's involved. So how many therapeutic trials are currently underway uh, for IBD? If you ever want to look for this data, just go to the clinicaltrials.gov website. Every human clinical trial has to be posted on that website. That's a, that's a rule. So if you want to look through those, you'll find there's about 68 now interventional trials looking at phase one, two, and three for Crohn's, and 81 interventional trials for ulcerative colitis. So there's a lot of activity going on in this space. There's a lot of discoveries being made. They're all getting tested and looked at out there. Um, <clears throat> it's a very exciting area you know, to be in, to kind of look at, at these things. And some of us in this room are participating in clinical trial work as well, uh, testing out these new medications. Just to give you a, a sort of a bird's eye view of the pipeline. Um, so I know it's, it's hard to read there, but it's just a a kind of an overview looking at phase two, phase three, and sort of the licensed products. And this slide's actually a little uh, over, uh, out, of due, out of date at this point because uh, some of these have moved from phase three into that license category. Others actually have, are actually being abandoned because they didn't move forward. And this is a, you know, a constantly moving process. So you'll see therapies from different classes and different areas kind of moving across this, this grid as, as things um, progress. And there's different areas of, um, of sort of similar medications. So you may see one company testing the same thing as another company. And that's, that's good because sometimes one may be a little bit more effective than another one as well. And sometimes those aftermarket studies, we mentioned the phase four, they'll even do comparison trials between some of these, these agents as well. So before I turn the microphone over to my colleague who's going to go into more detail about the, the actual pipeline medications, I did want to talk a little bit about how our goals in IBD have changed over time. So in the pre-biologic era, our goal was really just to get patients feeling better. We just wanted to get the frequencies of the, the diarrhea down. We just wanted to make them you know, feel a lot better. We, we didn't have a lot in our toolbox to really heal things up. Uh, today that's changed. So it was when the advent of the biologics, we were able to really start to see um, healing of the tissue. And initially there was sort of this step up approach where we were very worried about toxicity and, and infections and concerns around these medications. We still are, but I think our, our understanding and our ability to safely use the medicines has, has changed. And we actually have more of a top down approach now where we really try to squelch the disease quickly and keep it quiet. And we're trying to change the course of the, uh, the natural history of the inflammation that's going on. So you'll see the little target symbols and the arrows. We're, we're actually doing what's called treat to target now. So our targets have changed a little bit too. And, and our targets have moved as we kind of improved our markers and things. So we, we have things now called um, these uh, inflammatory markers like the C-reactive protein that's in the bloodstream or the fecal calprotectin level, which is in the stool. These are inflammatory markers we can actually track now and see how people are improving in regards to therapy. We also do a lot more imaging. You'll see us doing um, the CT scans and MRI scans more. We're doing a lot more scoping as well. And again, the target is changing to where we try to heal things back to normal. So visually, we'll go in and, and try to look and see if we can heal up all the ulcerations, heal up all the inflammation by being more aggressive with our immune therapies and shutting down that inflammation process. The, the issue that we're, um, we're now getting to in the sort of the future in terms of the disease control 
is even if it looks normal in there, if you take a biopsy and look at it under the microscope, there may still be some inflammation present. And the target that people are talking about now is to try to heal that back to normal. So basically, in a sense, sort of curing the disease in a way by being really aggressive and trying to shut down that inflammation. And the reason we're doing that is we want to prevent the complications from this. So we want to prevent ostomies. We want to prevent surgeries. We want to prevent uh, cancer development in the future, and that's the disease modification component on the right here. We want the quality of life to be as normal as possible. Our goal is to control the disease so it doesn't control the individual, and that's, that's the primary focus of what we're doing in there. Um, so this histologic healing, we know if we get to that level, we can actually prevent flares from happening. We can actually stop that. We're, we're also starting to see not only that component, but we're seeing a a bending of the curve on the, on the uh, surgery side. We're seeing less surgeries that are being needed too. So it's an exciting time to be an IBD. I gotta tell you, you know, this has changed enormously. You know, it was, it was just symptom control and now we're really moving towards, towards healing. And hopefully in the future we can even get to even other cures as well. I'm gonna pass on the microphone to my colleague who's gonna talk a little bit more about the actual therapies. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, thank you to Dr. Saberman for that um, so overview on our clinical trial process. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll be talking about specific therapies that are coming down the pipeline, and I, how we wanted to frame this talk was to discuss about what we have and what's coming that might be in a similar category. Uh, so the first category of medications we have are called the MABs. If you notice, all of these, their generic names end in the, in the suffix MAB, and that stands for monoclonal antibody. And so many people in this audience may be familiar with at least some of these, and I'll, these are listed the uh, generic names, which are always hard to pronounce, but I'll mention the trade names as well. So in the TNF antagonist category, uh, we have intravenous or infusion-based therapies, infliximab, which many of you may know as Remicade or the biosimilars that have come out since Inflectra, Absol, or Inflexus. And then we have the subcutaneous or the injectable um, TNF blockers. That's alimumab, that's Humira, Sertolizumab, which is Simzia, and Golimumab, which is Symponi. So th those are the three injectables. Then the next class you have are the anti-integrins, which currently are in an IV formulation, which is Vetalizumab or Intivio. And lastly, we have the anti-interleukins, which are administered as an IV initially, then transitioning to a sub-Q injection. And that's ustekinumab, which is Stellara. And the newest kit on the block, Rizankizumab, which was approved earlier this year, which is Skyrizi. So this is the current uh, sort of slate of biologics that are available for our patients. So what's coming down the pipeline? If you notice, all of the Medications listed on the left are either injectable or infusion-based therapies. And that's because these monoclonal antibodies are complex protein molecules that are, um, have to be administered that way because in the cut, they're very susceptible to breakdown by digestive acids or they're too large to pass into the intestinal lining to get into the body system. But there's a lot of inconvenience uh, associated with that. So they're really trying to develop these delivery systems that would allow for the first oral biologic molecule. And there have been three investigational drugs that have sort of shown some promise. Uh, of these, V565 is currently in phase two trial development, but essentially the, the goal here would be, can you take a TNF antagonist as a pill, as an oral pill that would you know, prevent the need from having to go into the office or inject yourself? And that's something that's probably a little bit further away because, again, the, the um, technology has to advance to that level, but it's something that there's a lot of sort of focus on. Something that's a little bit closer to market is the vetalizumab or Intivio, which is currently administered as an IV, uh, has been studied as an injectable, self-injectable sub-Q formulation. And I'll show actually some phase three data for that, and this is... Um, going to be submitted for FDA approval, and we hope sometime next year in 2023 that this will be able, uh, available uh, on the market. Uh, and lastly, um, in the anti-interleukin space, um, what I didn't mention is that Stellar was the first generation of these, and it blocked 
two molecules called IL-12 and 23. And since then, the second generation have come out, of which Rizankinzumab is one of them, which is more selective for IL-23 only, the thought being that being more selective to that molecule may achieve better efficacy and perhaps better safety. So in that space, there are two more IL-23 agents currently under development, guselkimab and mirakizumab. And what this allows for, then, with multiple uh, pharmaceutical companies developing their versions of these therapies, that we can start to do comparison to say which one of these is, works better, which one of these is safer. And this is, in our view, a very good development in our field, because then, essentially, it, it breeds competition amongst different agents, of then we can choose the best one. So these are two agents that are currently in development and um, we may see in the near future. This was the phase three trial data for the injectable vedolizumab or Intivio in Crohn's and this was published earlier this year. Uh, just to draw your eyes to the circular graphs on the left side, when you look at in the red, there was a 48% clinical remission rate and they compared this against placebo, uh, which is 34%. That's about a 14% increase in clinical remission rates with the injectable formulation, showing that, yes, this does work. Um, and on the right side, the bar graphs um, that list the all adverse events or side effects, serious adverse events, and treatment-related adverse events, we see that there are not major differences in the little bar graphs, showing that injectable betalizumab is safe. Now, if you're wondering how this might be administered, we don't know exactly yet because they have not gone through the FDA approval, but we know that in the study, it was dosed every two weeks. So we foresee this being probably used in perhaps some sort of combination where you get IV infusion for a certain number of doses, and then you switch to an every two week injectable. Again, this would provide a lot of convenience, cut the need for travel and having to be in an infusion center. One thing I want to highlight about the mirakizumab, this is one of those new anti-IL-23s in development, is that um, with time, as we've sort of performed patient survey studies, we've come to understand that perhaps even more so than stool frequency or bleeding, rectal urgency is one of the most disruptive symptoms for patients, given the unreliability and unpredictability that it really sort of causes for patients. And that's not something that we in the field necessarily focused on before. But mirakizumab was really a novel sort of trial design in which they included a separate endpoint of rectal urgency, this, this symptom that patients really um, have the most trouble with. And on this graph here, uh, on the horizontal line, the x-axis, we see the number of weeks after treatment. And on the vertical line on the left, we see patient, percent of patients reporting no urgency. So we're talking about zero urgency reported, and we see that all of the mirakizumab doses in the phase two trial by week 12 improved rectal urgency. So it just uh, goes to highlight that our tr clinical trials are getting more refined. We're capturing more endpoints now, and especially endpoints that are more meaningful to patients, which we hope ultimately will improve um, quality of life. Uh, moving on to the, what we call the NIBs, or the JAK inhibitors. Um, just a little bit of a science lesson here. So IL-23 is a chemical cytokine, and what that does is it basically activates JAK molecules which reside within the cell. And these JAK uh, molecules are important for the production of inflammatory proteins at the cellular level. So here um, in this box, I'll highlight that there are four different JAK molecules, JAK1, 2, 3, and TIK2. And this is important when it comes to the drug development. Um, for those who may or may not know, JAK inhibitors are oral molecules, of which uh, Zeljans or tofacitinib was the primary one on the market until recently. So when we talk about tofacitinib or Zeljans, this was the original JAK inhibitor. It's what we call a pan-JAK inhibitor. So it would block all four of those molecules, JAK1, 2, 3, TIK4, TIK2. The second generation that, that have started to come out, of which there's upadacitinib, which was just approved um, earlier this year as uh, the trade name is Rinvoke, is now a JAK1 selective inhibitor. And the thought here, again, with these second generation agents is if we can target molecules more specifically, in this case JAK1, which we believe to be a more important driver of gut inflammation than the other JAK molecules, can we achieve better results and better safety? 
So Rinvoq is now approved uh, for UC, and in this space, there is another drug in um, JAK1 selective inhibitor called Fogatinib uh, that's in study. And also, turning to a different JAK molecule, TIC2, there is an agent called Ducravacidinib, which is also in development. So again, the point here is that as we expand the number of options within a therapeutic class with increased targeted selectivity, we're hoping that we can achieve better outcomes. The last uh, group of agents I'll talk about are the, the MODs, or the S1P modulators. Um, so S1P is a molecule that's important for allowing activated white blood cells to exit the lymph node where they're normally housed. And so by blocking that transit, it keeps those white blood cells within the lymph node, and therefore they cannot get to the gut to cause inflammation. So that's how these agents work. We have one agent on the market already called Ozanamod, or Zaposia, and this came out last year. Uh, this is approved for UC. Um, and in this space, there is another S1P modulator named Atrazumab that is under development. So again, same sort of concept here. We have a new mechanism of action, multiple therapies being developed within that same class that allows for us to start doing comparative work. So in summary, there are a number of exciting therapies currently in the development pipeline, and this is more, more true now than ever. You know, at this point, we have a new agent coming out at least once a year, maybe a couple, and so it's a really exciting time for us as doctors treating patients with IBD because now we have more options available, whereas even in the near past, we didn't have that many options. You would say, you're going to have to stick with this agent because that's all we've got left. Now we can really think about how do we position and use these effectively. Over time, our goals of therapy have evolved. This is, as Dr. Cyberman um, highlighted, from just symptom relief to now deeper control of inflammation. And in the future, our goal is really to change the course of disease, where we're not just treating it, but we're actually changing the course of one's life and perhaps even preventing disease in the, fu in the future. Lastly, uh, as, I as I've highlighted, oral TNF agents, injectable vedolizumab, and more targeted second-generation versions of existing therapies such as anti-interleukins and JAK inhibitors uh, we expect to be available in the near future. Okay, we thank you for your time. And again, thank you to the foundation so much for hosting us. And, uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free. Sure. I was wondering on the injectable interio, it, how the efficacy in terms of remission is in comparison to the indication. So that's a great question. We are still awaiting that data. Um, so the way that the trial was designed is that everyone got IV infusions and then they were randomized to the injectable versus placebo, and really part of that is that for the FDA, what they primarily require is that it shows efficacy over no drug. Uh, but we are awaiting that data, and it's gonna be very important, obviously, for anyone that's concerned about loss of efficacy, switching from one to the other, yeah. Because there will be patients in the future that were starting on Antibio for the first time. We also have many, many patients that have been on Antibio for years. And the question is, can we transition them safely, yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard it's hard to compare trials um, from one to another, but just looking at it, it looked like it was it was about the same level, um, maybe even a little bit better because the dose was actually higher uh, in the injectable form. So that that may be an, a, a thing where it may actually be a little bit better. But we'll see. So the question is, do you treat diverticulitis in the Crohn's and colitis IBD disease group? Um, so so th there are some chronic forms of diverticulitis, um, but generally speaking, we, we don't usually 
use anti-inflammatory agents um, or immune suppressants, sorry for that. So it's a little bit, little bit different uh, type of treatment. For diverticulitis, it's more antibiotics and surgery sometimes it's, it's used for that. So it's a little, little bit, we don't sort of classify that in our group here. I think the question was, do you treat diverticulitis in the Crohn's and colitis IBD disease group? So I think, do we consider diverticulitis within Crohn's and colitis? Yeah. Oh, do you want me to answer this question? Oh, sorry, we have another. Um, we have a question, how do you assess which works in which patient? That's a very good question. We do have a speaker, Dr. Adam Ehrlich, who's gonna talk about choosing the right therapy for you. I will preface it and say, you know, that's sort of the holy grail, so to speak, of personalized medicine. How do we know exactly in whom the right therapy is the one? We haven't gotten there yet, but I'm sure Dr. Ehrlich will give you at least some of that. Uh, well, thank you. All right. I'm, I'm going to need a little clarification on this one, but it, the question was um, Remicade is given every three months, um, I guess, What's it supposed to do instead of the daily medication? Is that sort of the, the question? Um, so the, the, the Remicade um, works by shutting down that, that TNF, that anti-inflammatory pathway. And <clears throat> TNF is, is, is a, a cytokine or molecule that, that's produced whenever things get kind of revved up with our immune system. So by shutting that down, it, it shuts that component. And that, um, in, in terms of what it does instead of a daily medication, some of the, the other medications work differently and their mechanism of action is differently, but Remicade is one of those monoclonal antibodies that just targets a TNF molecule. One of the interesting things about Remicade, though, we, we, even though we've had out there, it's not just binding the TNF that's kind of in the circulation because there's another molecule out there that does that that doesn't work in IBD. But there's actually a membrane-bound form where it's actually probably on the cell surface and it may actually change how the cell functions a little bit when, um, when this monoclonal antibody, this TNF, um, this Remicade kind of hits that, that cell. So it's, it's still kind of a little bit of a mystery, but um, it's a very effective medication at, at sort of changing that inflammatory system. You have another question? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is selectivity in the gut largely derived from the target molecule for an inhibitor? And can a movement towards oral anti-TNF make the treatment more selective toward the gut? Um, it's a very good question. So the, the th thought behind that question is, if we give the TNF alpha antagonist orally, will it have more of a gut-specific or gut-selective mechanism? I don't think we believe that to be the case, primarily because the TNF um, and the membrane-bound ones are, are fairly widespread throughout the body, and that's why they have such a good effect. So even if it's delivered through the gut, the hope is that it actually gets into the circulating bloodstream to have that effect. Um, I don't know of data, maybe Dr. Starman knows about if it would be much more gut-selective, but I don't believe that that's the primary purpose of the oral administration. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I agree. I think one of the nice benefits we might see with oral medication, especially around children, you know, it'd be much easier for them to take that. Um, there's even rectal administration they're looking at um, to try to help heal up that area uh, if that's the only area that's involved. All right. I had an, another question about um, we often here when something stops working, like a biologic of people uh, have exhausted their options. Do these second generation developments allow revisiting of those types of biologic categories? And, and yes, it, it could mean that. Um, part, of, part of it depends on why they failed that biologic in the first place. Was it just loss of response? Was it development of antibodies against that molecule? Uh, so there's, there's, you have to kind of look at the, the reasons for that. But one of the things that I think it's very exciting about this area is that we might actually be able to start combining some of these different mechanisms. So we've got where you know we're sort of stopping the circulation of those white blood cells as well as dropping down the cytokines, and we may see even bigger benefits in terms of, of that. And it, a lot still has to be done, and that's why it's really important to get people to participate in these trials and be involved 
Uh, that's the only way we're going to figure out what works and what doesn't work. I'd like to chime in on that. Um, so the, as the, the drug trials have gotten more sophisticated, they've gotten savvier with this too. And for example, uh, with the Rizankizumab studies, they actually included patients who had uh, not had a response to Ustekimab or Stelara, meaning that they had not had response to the original anti-IL-12 and 23, but it still allowed them to participate in the trial to answer the precisely that question. If someone had not had a response to one agent in that class, would they respond to the second generation? And there was a response. And so this does show that there is some difference with these second generation molecules um, in achieving a response even if you've not had a response to the first class. So you, you mentioned S1P modulators for ulcerative colitis, are they also for Crohn's disease? So uh, yes, they're being tested in Crohn's disease. Um, so almost, and it's been kind of interesting, back when I started in the lab, there was this sort of split between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's in terms of therapies, and one felt it was based on this kind of inflammation, and one was based on this other kind of inflammation, and they were completely different. That's totally changed, and that changed with the, the administration of the biologics, because all of a sudden they were working in both diseases very effectively. And I, and I think what we're seeing now is that, that uh, inflammatory bowel disease is a spectrum of different diseases, and we may call one Crohn's, we may call one ulcerative colitis, but they do share a lot of important pathways and mechanisms. So everything gets tested now pretty much in both uh, things as well. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.